Please stand. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The scripture passage, which is the basis for today's sermon, is the gospel reading from John 16, verses 23 through 33, particularly the first two verses. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. My dear friends in Christ Jesus, our Lord, the first verse of today's Gospel reading is one of the most misquoted verses in the Scripture at least in our society. And it is the oldest temptation in the book, literally. Did God really say what he said? Or can you twist it to make it say what you want it to mean? And so it is misquoted very frequently. Because God works through the means of grace, the word and the sacraments, they can be um, rejected. God comes to us through words, through um, the elements in holy baptism of water, in bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. They can be rejected. God does not force himself upon us. However, when temptation comes along, the tempter never tells you the consequence of your sin. The wages of sin is death, which if we remember that all the time, we would be less likely to, uh, to view the temptation as something desirable to us. When selfish people hear the words of Jesus, which I just read, they imagine that all you have to do is ask for something and it's yours. God will have to give it to you. But that is not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus chose his words very carefully every time that he spoke. If he wanted to tell you that you could have had every, anything you wanted, he would have said something like, ask whatever you want and my Father will give it to you. But that is not what Jesus said. What Jesus said was, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Now whatever you ask in my name, according to Jesus, it's not some, even that is not some formula to get what you want. It's not like, you can only just say the magic words and whatever you want will just appear in front of you. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Plenty of people try to call upon God's name to manipulate him, to make him do what they want. But God is neither fooled nor manipulated. When it comes to prayer, sinful people do not know what to ask for. And that goes for all of us. St. Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 8, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. So even we do not know exactly what we ought to pray for. In the blindness of our sin, we think that pleasure and comfort will be what, would need, what we would need to make us happy. But pleasure and comfort is rarely what is best for anyone. Now, if God blesses you with such things, then you should be thankful without feeling guilty. But you should not expect that you ought to receive any of these good gifts from God. If he gives it to you, it is purely because God is generous and merciful and, and kind, not because you have deserved anything so good. 
Now the context of our gospel reading clearly gives us the real story of what we can expect from our sinful lives. Near the end of the reading, Jesus tells his disciples, in this world you will have tribulation. Now if anyone could get what they wanted, I'm pretty sure no one would ask for tribulation or trouble or trials or pain. No one likes trouble, but we are all sinners living in a world full of sinners. We all suffer temptations, trials, troubles, sorrow, sickness, and death. Naturally, according to our nature, we do not know what to pray for. But when Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them how to pray, he gave them the Lord's Prayer. And if you are ever at a loss about what to pray for, Pray the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer shows us what we ought to pray for also. One example is the third petition, which says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The, the third petition is not something that we would normally think to ask of God. Sinful people are much more likely to ask, let my will be done as I want it to be. This is why we can't have nice things. We don't know rightly what to ask for. But God knows what we need even more than we do. And Jesus shows us what we ought to pray for. And that is why Christians pray that God's will should be done on earth as it is in heaven. But then we might ask, well, what is God's will that we are asking be done on earth? Well, this leads us back into our gospel reading for today. Jesus said, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. The name of Jesus. What does that mean? The name Jesus means Savior. Now, many people are named Jesus, or the Old Testament equivalent to Jesus, which is Joshua. Maybe there's some, someone named Joshua here. But Jesus of Nazareth, who died on the cross and then rose again on the third day later, he's the only one who lived out that name of Savior. He's the one who died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world and rose victorious over sin and death. This is what Jesus is most happy to do. This is the will of God, to save his people from their sins. And it's not just Jesus either, but also the Father and the Holy Spirit. This is the will of the Trinity. They, the three persons of the Trinity are united in this task, and they all work for the goal of your salvation. And that is why Jesus says, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believed that I came from God. Jesus is not a rebellious son. Jesus is the obedient son, the obedient son of the Father. He had to be the obedient son so that he could be worthy to pay the price for the sins of the world. And so Jesus obeyed his Father in everything, even when it was the Father's will to punish him for our sins and for the sins of the whole world on the cross, so that we might be redeemed from sin and death. Jesus was willing to obey the Father because he loves the Father with all his heart, with all his mind, with all his soul, and with all his strength. And Jesus loves his neighbor as he loves himself. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard this, but there are some atheists in this world who accuse God of being a child abuser on account of sending his son to be the atoning sacrifice for sin. Can you imagine that? Of course, the father did not force the son to go to the cross to suffer and die. Jesus went willingly to do that. He knew what was in store for him. He could read the scriptures. He knew 
what was to be expected of the promised Messiah, but he went willingly to the cross. It wasn't as if the Father had forced him to do that. Also, the life and death and, and suffering of Jesus is the greatest act of love in the history of the world, and yet the world calls that child abuse. Brothers and sisters in Christ, beware of the ways of the world. They call evil good, and they call what is good evil. Do not follow the ways of the world. Jesus was the obedient son, and is still is. And he won for you forgiveness of all of your sins. Jesus was not rebellious. Have you seen the effects of rebellion? I saw it just yesterday, and it was a horrible scene. I have not been a full-time pastor since my church closed many years ago, so as I wait for a full-time call, I work in a secular job as a truck driver, and yesterday as I was driving down M14 um, in my secular job, I saw the, um, the cleanup of an accident there, a horrible accident. Now I, I should let you know I'm not a gawker. I did not slow down even a little bit, but I glanced over to see what was going on. And in one glance, I saw something that you don't normally see on highway accidents. And in my line of work, I see plenty of accidents. But what I saw were two severely crashed vehicles which were burned terribly. It was clearly a head-on collision. And if you saw the news reports, you see that that is exactly what had happened. The wrong way driver died, as well as a child in the other car, and the child's mother later died in the hospital. Uh, the other two family members survived with injuries. This is the kind of thing that results in, as, as a result of rebellion. Our highways are divided for the reason that one side goes one way, the other side goes the other way. The rebel says, rules are for other people. I want to go my own way. And for one reason or another, the result of the rebellion is destruction and death. Who can save us from such rebellion and tragedy? Only Jesus can save us from the effects of rebellion and sin. Lord, save us. And he has saved us. Jesus is not only named Savior, but that is what he accomplished in his life. He lived out the name of Savior in everything that he did. And what's more than that, not only winning our salvation, but then he gives us that salvation as a free gift without any, anything on our part to, to earn it. It's a gift to everyone who believes. As St. Paul writes in Romans 5, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Christian hope is not the same as worldly hope. Christian hope is the trust in Jesus, who died and who rose from the dead, victorious over sin and death for you, for your sake that he might rescue you from sin and all of its consequences, including death. So what should you pray for? You may want riches and comfort, but whether you are rich or poor, you may still be saved through faith in Jesus. Riches don't matter, ultimately. You may want good health, comfort in sorrow or pain, but you may be saved whether you are young or old, and, and no matter what happens, if you are in pain or healthy, 
you may still be saved through faith in Jesus. You may want good friends, but Jesus may save you even if the whole world turns against you and says that you are wrong. Jesus will still save you. Jesus is your only hope of salvation. Jesus is the most important thing in this whole world. All the riches of the whole world cannot save you from sin, but Jesus gives your salvation to you as a free gift. Pray for that first. As Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things will be given to you as well. Jesus lived and died to rescue you from sin and death. Will he not also give you everything else you need in this life? Pray for forgiveness and salvation first, but you can also pray for the things that you think that you need. But for all of your daily bread kind of prayers, pray that it would be done according to God's will. Some of the things that you think you need, God may know better and ask you to go without for a time if that is his will. Jesus lived and died so that you might live with him forever in his heavenly paradise. He will not let you fall for a lack of something that you need in this life. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is our hope of salvation and our hope in this life. There is nothing greater that we can have than the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation which Jesus has already won for us. Martin Luther gives us a good explanation of how we live through our lives in faith. He says, the righteous man, meaning the one who lives by faith and is justified through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteous man has peace with God, but affliction in the world because he lives in the spirit. The unrighteous man, meaning the unbeliever, the unrighteous man has peace with the world, but affliction and tribulation with God because he lives in the flesh. But as the spirit is eternal, so also will be the peace of the righteous man and the tribulation of the unrighteous. And as the flesh is temporal, so will be the tribulation of the righteous and the peace of the unrighteous. May Christ keep you in faith that you may not be at peace with the world, but that you may be at peace with God and receive all of his blessings, one for you by Jesus through his life and death and resurrection. May Christ give you this peace because he has overcome the world. Amen.